So thank you all for being here bright and early on a Sunday morning to talk about mental health. <laughs> Always enlightening. Um, OK, so if you want to move us along. Sure. <clears throat> so if you want to start us off. Sure. So we're going to talk about gaming and mental health in the queer community. One of the things that we talked about is that we weren't really sure how to even title this presentation, and we went back and forth a lot. Um, it was between either queer or LGBTQ. We ended up choosing queer because we felt that it was more inclusive. So even though we know that some people still don't identify with this word, that's why we chose it. And I just wanted to be upfront on why we chose that instead of the other, instead of the acronym. Um, so just to kind of introduce ourselves real quick, um, I'm Joey Hanna. I'm a licensed psychologist. I work at New Mexico State University. Uh, I'm Serenity Sensacion. Um, I'm also studying to be a PhD, but right now I only have an MS for the next month. Um, <laughs> You're almost I, there. I know, almost. And I'm a psychology intern actually up in, in Oregon, but I'll be coming back down soon. Yeah. And we got connected to do this talk because we're both uh, gamers and we're both very interested in mental health, obviously. And so this was something that we wanted to do to try to convey some information, see what might be helpful to you all, what you all might need. Uh, or want to learn about. So we have our agenda, and then hopefully we can get some feedback about what you all want to hear about, too. All right? So <clears throat> one of the reasons in particular that we wanted to talk about this is a lot of the research that's out there on gaming really isn't that good. Um, just to be honest, um, a lot of it's very negative. So most of the stuff that you probably have heard about um, would be in the news, you know, um, video games cause violence and, you know, all these things, we'll go through this in a minute. Um, but a lot of it's actually not very good research. Becoming a good consumer of research can be kind of difficult. Um, this is something that we're taught a lot in our field, but, you know, if you see something on, God forbid, Fox News, um, you know, you're, you're going to see a study that's probably not that good, but just because it's been published, everybody goes crazy for it. Um, a lot of stuff, you know, if you're looking for something negative, you're going to find it. And in a lot of research, they found, you know, all these negative things because one, they were looking for it, and two, it was kind of done by one person who was the editor for the journal. So you can kind of get your stuff published and not have to publish everybody else's things. So a lot of people don't necessarily notice that, and there's a lot of things that don't always get through the mainstream publishing that you don't hear about. So we wanted to try to go through, yeah, go through some things that you might have heard about but aren't necessarily true, and there might be some truth to it, but just to give you more clear information. So one of the big points that people talk about is violence, right? That if you play violent video games, you're gonna become a violent person. And that's really not true at all. Um, so when somebody says that to you, you can now say, it's not true. There's no research to support it. Um, one thing that people do find is that if you have just naturally aggressive tendencies, you might be drawn towards more violent media. Does that mean you're going to act out on it? Well, no. Um, there are over, I mean, especially with you know, mobile gaming, at least over a billion people in this world playing video games. How many of them actually act out on something violent? A very, very, very small percentage. But you see them in the news, so you think it's a ton of people. Um, and actually, a lot of times, if somebody is more aggressive, they play a violent video game, it actually gets those feelings out. You know, we, a lot of us probably know video games can be an outlet, right? And so if you are more aggressive, if you're playing a violent video game, you actually get a lot of that stuff out of your system, which is probably healthier and safer in a lot of ways. One of the other points was, yeah, <laughs> I know, was with uh, impulsivity. And so impulsivity meaning that you can't really control your urges to do something, you just do it. And you don't really think about it, you don't think about the consequences. Um, and there's, there's a little bit of truth to this, but not in the way that people usually think. Uh, a lot of times people think impulsivity, you know, I, I want it and I want it right now. And, and that's kind of what it looks like. Um, but with gaming, you know, we're getting instant feedback. When you play a game, when you make a move, when you um, get a certain score, you get feedback right then and there. And so instead of becoming this you know, impulsive person that can't control themselves, what we're actually doing is we're retraining our brain. Um, because when you think about how school systems are set up, you take a class, you maybe do an assignment, you take an exam, you 
get feedback like maybe a week later. I don't know if anybody's had that kind of experience. So it's delayed gratification, hopefully gratification, if you did well. Um, but it's delayed, right? And so with video gaming, you're learning how to uh, get instant feedback. So your brain changes a little bit, and this is actually something that people are talking a lot about in the school systems, that if this is what kids are learning now, and they're training their brains in this way at home, we need to change our school system to, to meet that, um, so that people are getting more instant feedback, more interactive kinds of feedback. Um, where this can be a problem is actually more in the casual gaming community with microtransactions. That dirty word. I see some people shivering. Yes, um, and you know we see that a lot, like uh, Candy Crush, you know, and games like that. Where, <laughs> sorry, I just saw a lot of people's mouths drop when I said that. Um, you know, and and it's just because it's right there. You press a button, you've spent some money, and and you don't think about it. You don't think about the consequences, and then you see your bank statement. Yeah. The other areas in social skills. <laughs> yeah. And there's always this question of, uh, do video games impair social skills? You know, and the, the stereotype was somebody sitting in their basement, not interacting with anybody, you know, and just playing video games all day. And in the modern age especially, everything has an online component, for the most part. And so there's some truth to this, like we're not developing social skills, but it's in a non-traditional way. So people, when they say social skills, they're usually saying, in-person, live interaction, right? And in video game worlds and online interactions, you're developing social skills, but it's a very different kind of social skill. An online interaction has its own set of rules, its own language sometimes, um, and it's just different. It's not any less valid of a social skill, it's just a different kind than what people are typically researching or trying to look at. Um, one of the things I like to think about is if you were to take somebody who has never had any sort of exposure to online video gaming and they have great in-person social skills, put them online, they may have no idea what they're doing. And they may struggle with that in the same way that somebody who's been gaming all their life might struggle with an in-person, face-to-face uh, -face interaction. So again, it's, it's not that it's um, a bad social, you're not, it's not that you're not learning social skills, it's more of that you're learning a different set of social skills. Um, the other thing, and, and I think you could, might be able to speak a little bit more to this, is that this can sometimes also be helpful for people with different kinds of disorders, might be on the autism spectrum, maybe have social anxiety. Yeah, um, so one of the things that I've done in, in my practice with people who have social anxiety, specifically in our gamers, is figuring out how can I um, help this person have most, more social interactions online first. So how do we test out just an average conversation? You know, today on your MMO, I want you to talk to someone who you don't know, a stranger, just say hi, maybe join their party, something like that. And it becomes a part of treatment and it's really helpful because then after they practice that, then we can start practicing um, in-person interaction. I'll have people come into the session who'll talk about gaming. So it's about a topic that the person feels comfortable about. So when it comes to social interaction, I do think that online social interaction can be really helpful. And in person, it's just, um, like you were saying, it's just a little bit different. Yeah. So with attention and concentration, a lot of people have been saying in the news that with things like ADHD, are, are people familiar with ADHD? Yeah, that video games are to blame. They're the big evil that has caused all of the ADHD and all of the children all around. Um, and this actually isn't true. A lot of the studies, the good studies that have been published, um, have shown that um, children that, and, and adults that have trouble with attention and concentration actually can learn more skills through video games. Um, the confusion is that, that impulsivity piece. People see the impulsivity and they say, you know, oh my god, here are these kids and they're just not able to hold attention and do this and do that. And it's actually a little bit more of that impulsivity part. It really has very little to do with ADHD. Um, and I don't know about you all, but have you ever tried to play a platformer when you're distracted? <laughs> How many times did you die? You know, it, it, it's, you can't have distraction when you're playing games for the most part. And so um, there's really not a lot of research to support this idea that if you are uh, playing a lot of video games, you're going to develop ADHD. That's not really how it works. But again, that information gets out there. 
Another good example, uh, there's this study that was done through uh, the University of Florida and a couple of other schools. I just know it because I went to UF. Uh, it's called the ACTIVE study. And it was a group of researchers that was actually looking at um, elderly and aging populations and gave them a bunch of DSs with brain age and monitored their cognitive abilities and actually saw improvements. So video games can be helpful too. And of course, we have to talk about addiction, right? Because uh, addiction is another one of those big things that comes up all the time. Um, I was probably that kid grabbing onto his computer. <laughs> it's not me, not really, but could have been. So most of the time people, when they're talking about uh, gaming addiction, they basically are talking about it from the framework of like a drug addiction. And they're not the same. They're not even close. Um, it's basically like gambling more than anything. There's this idea in psychology and behavioral psychology called schedules of reinforcement. So depending on when you do a behavior and when you are rewarded for that behavior. And in gambling, it's totally random, right? So you keep doing it until you get that payoff and you get all excited and then you keep doing it again and then you've lost all of your payoff from before. Um, and gaming can mirror that a little bit because you keep playing until you get your, um, your award or your reward of some sort and you don't always know exactly when that's gonna happen depending on the game that you're playing. Um, so that's kind of what keeps people hooked. But a true addiction is very different. With a true addiction, all areas of your life are really severely impaired. Um, and that's the part that can look a little bit like a drug addiction. So things like um, financial issues, uh, social issues, you know, might be like lying a lot to conceal your behaviors. Um, and there are some people that might have problems with gaming. I don't even know if I want to share how much money I've spent on gaming before. And some of you probably had that experience, and it's just because it's something that might be important to you or you might prioritize. You, maybe you have a little bit of a problem in that area, but that doesn't mean that you are addicted in that like clinical term that you know you need to go to like rehab or something for. Um, but to give you an idea of why this is uh, an area that is important to talk about, there's this thing called the DSM. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, right? And so this is something that psychologists and psychiatrists use to, um, to provide a diagnosis for somebody that they're working with. The DSM-5 came out just recently, and there was uh, a consideration to include, um, what was it exactly? It was an, internet and gaming yeah. addiction, something like that? Yeah, a diagnosis yeah. for internet and gaming addiction. It's not in the DSM because there was no research to support it. So keep that in mind. <laughs> I did want to add that because of that, I feel that a lot of people in our field anyway um, have been talking about addiction more often. and. Um, there is kind of like this stigma that if people game, they're going to be addicted to it. And I do wonder if it's because of all the talk that happened around the DSM. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. So with negative interactions, this is, we're going to shift a little bit, but I think all of us have had at least one experience of a negative interaction online, maybe on Xbox Live or something else. And I can share a lot of my own experiences, but I was wondering if anyone felt comfortable sharing some of theirs. What are some of the, the, the things that have happened to you online? Sure. Uh, well, there's a lot of deception. So, like, I'm a trans guy, like mostly women, and I'll find a chick, and then it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a dude. I'm a 40-year-old married dude, and that's kind of, like, traumatized. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there is that idea of people being someone who they're who they're not online. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, the person in the back. Uh, and then something as a trans woman that happens a lot too, especially yeah. vocally, because so many games you interact vocally on you know, like a headset or mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. I used to play WoW a lot, and you would constantly get misgendered by guild members just because of my voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've heard that a lot from people. Absolutely. A huge one that everyone at party probably knows about is the second they find out you're a girl normally, if you're doing something that's not considered a girl game, they get all upset at you, like, oh, what are you doing on here? And they just like, especially if you start like killing and wounding <laughs> <laughs> like, when, when the Halo uh, 
uh, me, my older brother, and my younger brother always played, and I always died all the time, so I thought I sucked. So when I went to a land, and they were, they were having a tournament, I was like, I'll play, I'll probably be out in the first round. Ended up winning, because apparently my brothers were so much better than everyone else <laughs> that I was playing against, that everyone started getting mad and be like, you're cheating, you're not doing anything, like, you're just using all these OP weapons, and <laughs> mm-hmm. that's not fair. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just, like, I have a pistol, and occasionally I would grab the shotgun, like, I'm playing the exact same way you guys are. I just happen to be better. (laughs) (laughs) Good for you. (laughs) Well, and to add to that, I used to play Halo a lot myself, and I remember that I actually ended up... um, using that voice modification thing that's on Halo. And the reason why I did that is because people would target me. Yeah. So actually what would happen is that every time I'd speak up and I sound female, um, I would die almost instantly. Because they assume you're the, the weaker player. Correct. Go after. E- yeah, even my own team would go after me. And so unfortunately, I ended up having to change my voice. So, yeah. Yeah, and this is something that, that we hear about a lot. I mean, um, you know, people sometimes not feeling safe online. And, and this is where some of those more negative things can come in, that this is unfortunately one of the more true aspects. Um, you know, when you're called things, you know, like you see up here, um, these are from sites um, not in the kitchen anymore, and um, Fat, Ugly, or Slutty, has anybody heard of these sites? And, and it's um, uh, these two women that have had these kinds of interactions and been cataloging them to show people like, hey, this is what we're dealing with. Um, so that's where these are from, by the way. Um, We'll move on to the next one. I mean, I have a non-comprehensive list of all the possible things that you've probably been called at some point online. And what I noticed, at least, is that I feel that that people are more of a target if, um, well, for women, I've noticed anyone who's not in the gender binary, uh, people of color, if they somehow find out. Um, I was just going to share one short experience when I used to play Le- like Left 4 Dead. I always played Lewis because he's my favorite character. I love him, and um, and he's an African American male. And I remember that I would always get targeted because I would either get comments about being um, black because they assumed that I was, or that I would get comments because I'm a woman. And so it kind of felt like, wow, every single time I play this game, this is what happens. These are the comments that I get, um, which is kind of disappointing. Yeah. 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 And so hopefully we'll get into just a little bit later about how to manage some of those interactions or ways that you can have more positive interactions with people as well. Yep. All right. Okay, so some of the good stuff. So now that we've gone through all the negative, let's talk (laughs) talk about (laughs) what are the positive things of gaming? Because if there weren't any positive things, we wouldn't all be gamers, right? So I do feel that these things are not talked about as much in the media. Unfortunately, negative portrayals kind of take over, and they don't talk about some of the benefits um, that are in gaming. And there actually are games that are therapeutic. I think that many people in the room might be able to have a game or two that really touched you, that really changed who you are as a person, right? So that's a big deal. Um, well, and I, I remember when you had written Problems Lying in the Sand. Yeah, just thinking, just thinking that um, this idea of having a problem with gaming, um, it's like we were saying before, isn't always that clear to define. Um, and we'll give some examples, um, I think, in the next part mm-hmm. about what that might mean. But just to give you an idea that um, problem is very individual. And so it's not just this blanket statement that you usually hear about. Yeah, so one of the things that I've, I really like about gaming is the fact that you can have a, spa- a safe space and you can feel empowered. You can find a group of individuals that you really relate to that maybe are having the same struggles that you're having. Um, also the fact that it's a fantasy world. It's a good stress relief just to go and game. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that in gaming, many people have mentioned that it's a safe place where they can explore their sexuality and gender for the same reason that you can, you can be whoever you want to be in some games, right? And maybe you're struggling with something in yourself, and this gives you an opportunity to, um, to try that out in a safe space because this isn't trying it out with your friends and family in person. This is a more contained area to do it. Um, also, that addiction can be treating, if you do have gaming addiction. Yeah. There are things that, that can be done to help with that. Um, and Joey already talked a little bit about how that's different from other addictions. Yep. 
So what are some of the benefits of gaming? Here are just a few. <laughs> so <laughs> I just love this picture. So. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things I was going to share, so I'm actually not originally from, from the States. I'm actually from Puerto Rico. And my first language was Spanish. And for me, video games really helped me because it actually helped me learn English, which in turn helped me get into a college here in the United States and now be on my way to being a psychologist. Um, and I could have never done that without games. It was actually playing RPGs through my childhood, trying to figure out what they were saying, because I didn't know, and eventually getting to a point where I actually started to understand. And it helped me in my, in my day-to-day life, which was great. Um, also, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about some of the research around this, but just here are some of the things that, we, that the research has found that you can get out of a benefit in gaming. Do you have anything to add on this one? Um, I would I would just say too that yeah with a lot of this stuff people don't always think about these as being benefits um, or they might think of these might not think of these as um, readily available benefits so you know when you're when you're playing a game whether it's console whether it's PC whatever it is you have to do a lot with your hands and you have to do a lot with hand-eye coordination spatial reasoning a lot of things that are hard skills to develop otherwise. Um, it's not very common that you know you go to your hand-eye coordination spatial reasoning class in elementary school. <laughs> so you know, so you you're developing this skill at a better rate than some of your peers. Yeah, and one thing I want to add, and and this uh, research is not in here, but I was reading about. Um, there were these surgeons, and they ended up having them play a video game half an hour a day. And then they had a control group of people who weren't playing video games. And they actually found that the surgeons who were playing video games were better. So their skills at being a surgeon, those fine motor skills, actually improved in comparison to people who didn't. And these are people who had never gamed in their life. So these are just real um, benefits that you can get from gaming. Yeah. They're also using some gaming in uh, military to try to train people, and not like the, oh, I played a lot of Call of Duty, so I'm good at you know, shooting guns, and, and there's not really a lot of truth to that, sorry. <laughs> but, um, but they're actually using <clears throat> video games in, in the military to try to train people on decision making, um, sp again, spatial reasoning. You know, if you have to go around this corner and do something, how are you gonna do it? How quickly can you make that decision? Well, and it's interesting that, that you mentioned that. Um, I actually worked at the, at the VA for a short period of time, and I remember that many of the veterans who were coming back who were dealing with some of the stress of just reacclimating re to civilian society, they actually really liked playing games like Call of Duty and things like that, and it helped them feel a little bit less stressed out. Um, it helped them have like this release of like, oh, this actually feels familiar. Of course, it's not the same, but many men actually thought that it was helpful for them. So what are some positive in-game interactions? I mean, if you're in a guild and you have a really close-knit group of friends, that can be a great support system, right? You can have people who have you back, like your back. You have people who maybe can protect you when the other negative things online are happening. I, I know that for a while, I was in a group myself. I was the only woman. And um, I remember that when I started playing with them, things changed dramatically on the Xbox Live because I did have a group of people who would defend me, who when people were trying to vote me out because I'm a woman, which happened a lot, they would always unvote, and they'd be like, you know what, you guys are jerks, we're leaving. And it was great to have that group of guys who'd be like, yeah, we're gonna support you and we're gonna be here for you. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed that I didn't know to you mentioned, to, to you mentioned was um, how you can use this in real life. You want to talk about the resume? <laughs> yeah. So there's a, a an article that was written kind of recently about uh, the COO of Semantic. You know, like Norton Antivirus kind of stuff. Um, and in getting that position, part of his resume was his World of Warcraft resume. Um, and uh, yeah, I see some people like what, um, and and where where that came from was you're asking me to be in a leadership position. Here's an example of my leadership, and was actually able to pull on that as a reference for organization, for leadership, for online interactions, and actually in the um, in this person's previous position where they decided this was a good thing to do was with Starbucks. Mm -hmm. You know that Starbucks app that you probably have on your phone where you get the little stars every time you buy something and it's like a little reward? That's where that came from. <laughs> so uh, this can actually be something that might help you down the road. I'm not saying, you know, go put your MMO of choice on your <laughs> resume necessarily, but think about how it might be helpful. It might be a thing that could actually benefit you depending on how you spend it.
Yeah, and, and, and I would say that even for, for us, I mean, it's been helpful in my career for sure. Just the fact that um, I know about this kind of like, well, niche group in psychology that a lot of psychologists, psychologists don't actually. And so um, when people come in and they're talking about gaming or anything to do with online interaction, they normally consult with me. And the reason why is because many people are not trained in that. I'm sure you've had oh, yeah. similar experiences. Yeah. Or I'll have that moment where somebody will say, yeah, I was playing LOL last night, and then just kind of that <laughs> moment where they're looking to see if you respond, and you're like, yeah, I know about League. And they're like, oh, okay, all right. You know. <laughs> yeah. So this is one of the studies that, that I had really enjoyed, but basically that people who play pro-social games, this is actually including shooters if you're on a team, um, were more likely to help people in, in person or in their day-to-day -day interactions. And I thought that was really interesting that when they compared gamers to non-gamers, they were able to not only help more often, but uh, if I remember right from the study, they, they formed a team easier, everyone kind of had a position, and they were able to get the job done. So that just shows how some of these skills can, can translate over. Yeah. I think sometimes a, a good um, real life example too could be uh, if you play some of those games where they might, where you might make a decision and then they show how other people made decisions. Um, I'm thinking like um, Infamous or uh, Catherine, you know, where, where they might say to you like, here was your decision, here's what other people did. The majority of people tend to pick the good decision at least kind of the, the or good, I'll say, the pro-social decision, like <laughs> yeah. the first time through. Um, and so there, there is even, you can see those examples around. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't know, I just thought that was fun. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's true, there's really not a whole lot that's all that bad depending on what happens, but you might hear more about the bad things. Well, it also depends how you use video games, right? I mean, I think that's what we're trying to say. There's good and negative to everything, and there's a lot of positive things that you can get out of gaming. Yep. Okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about mental health, um, and more specifically in the queer community. Um, one of the things that is important to know is that um, as queer people, we are a little bit more susceptible to mental health issues. Um, and want to be clear, and, and this is becoming more clear in the psychology field, it has nothing to do with being queer itself, that you may have a problem. It's because of society and society's reactions and the things that um, you might be up against because of that that make, uh, that make us in the community more susceptible to mental health. It has nothing to do with your identity itself. So hopefully that is something that I'm just preaching to the choir at this point, but if not, if that's new information, please hopefully hear that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that one of the things that come up a lot is well, multiple levels of oppression. I mean, there's this thing called, called intersectionality, which basically means that um, your different minority statuses start increasing your level of stress. So if you just think like, well, I'm, I'm trans, I'm also a person of color, um, I identify as female, like you just start adding all of those together and it, it makes it even more difficult because that means that you're getting a lot of different types of oppression from society. And so things like that can increase your likelihood to develop some sort of um, well, depression or anxiety, but it's because of the interactions you're having with others. It's not because there's anything in you, if that makes sense. Right, mm -hmm. exactly, and and so people um, can feel those levels of oppression even within a group, you know, and um, and we talk about that a lot, you know, that if you're like you said, if you're in the queer community, and then you say I'm also a gamer, your pool gets a little smaller, and then you may say, you know, that you identify as bisexual, so then that oppression kicks in even further. Sadly, even within the community, you know, and same with the trans community, it gets even smaller, and then you know, so you can get down and down into these levels of oppression. Yeah, and I, for, for me, like that's one of the reasons why I thought this convention was so great, honestly, because I know that as, as a queer woman myself, I, 
I didn't really have that space. Right? There's very few places I felt comfortable. And so when this first came around, I was like, wow, there actually is a community. I mean, you can look around, you can see how many people are here. So obviously there is a community, we just have to talk to each other and find <laughs> each other, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things I want to talk about a little bit was just some of the bullying that happens online. And um, I mean, there is, there is this idea that it might be happening more because people are anonymous and maybe they feel more comfortable in saying things. And so unfortunately, what, well, we talked about this a little bit already, but when you're having interactions online, you might start getting bullied and having some negative interactions. That's why it's important to, to check yourself, basically. Now, if you're in that situation, may, may, maybe leave the game or maybe find a group of people who are really positive, but to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> the other point on here about uh, coming out it's important to mention is a lot of times people think about coming out as this one-time thing. It's not for most people if they choose to come out. Um, coming out might be a daily thing and that has its own level of stress and that stress can weigh on you. Um, I have that experience all the time. You know, I'll be meeting with somebody for the first time and they say, oh, do you have a girlfriend? Okay, here we go. <laughs> you know, and, and you just kind of have to go through that conversation. And it, for some people, it might get easier, and for some people, it might get more difficult. But there's always that extra thing you're thinking about. There's always that extra little bit of stress that's there um, that might weigh down on you. Well, and I, I just wanted to add a little bit to that, that it's always your decision who you're coming out to and when. Um, because sometimes I feel like there's this idea that we need to be out in all situations of our life. And you know what? Sometimes it's not safe. And sometimes it's okay not to be out. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong. I think that everyone needs to make that individual decision in each situation. So that's how coming out is a lifelong process. Because yeah. maybe you don't, maybe you don't say anything. Maybe you're just like, you know what, it's not that. I'm not gonna come out to this person because maybe this is not the best place. Yeah, so feel free you know, to make that decision for your own safety. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, we talked about the sociopolitical stuff. Building resiliency, I wanted to also throw in a, a positive note here about mental health. Sometimes having to deal with these kinds of things that we're talking about might be very difficult can also build up your ability to manage them better. And you might have, think of it like having a stronger immune system. You know, you might have that ability to really manage the things that people are throwing at you in ways that others don't. So you can also really build up a lot of resiliency to deal with the world, uh, which is a very positive thing. So with gaming in particular in the queer community, a lot of the things that we see as being very positive, like we mentioned before, is reaching out for support. This might be a place where you can actually interact with other people online in, things, in spaces that you really love and really enjoy, uh, just like we're all doing here. And that can be very affirming, very positive. Well, on, a, on another note, just um, feeling empowered and standing up for either yourself or someone else in an online community might actually help you do that in person because you're already getting that experience, right? So, you, so you're already getting some idea of, well, what does it mean to stand up for myself and to reclaim my own power? And it could be a good way to practice that. Yeah. Validation can also be a very big part of mental health. When you feel like you're the only person out there, when you feel like nobody is going through what you're going through, and you're really struggling with it alone, you have somebody that comes up to you that you find shares a lot of the same stuff with you, and it's like, oh my god, I'm not alone in this. Mm -hmm. And that can feel really good. And that can be, you know, we, we talk, uh, we hear a lot of talks at this con especially now about building your own games, you know, sharing your story. Getting, getting your story out there, because that's where this can really be helpful. You can really impact other people and, and validate other people or find another game that maybe validates your own experiences. And that can be very powerful. Well, there's one thing I wanted to add about being your true self that's up there. We've talked about that a little bit. One thing that I really love about being online is the fact that your true self can change. So I know that what I've appreciated is being able to experiment with the fact of like, well, I'm not sure what my sexuality is, or you know what, maybe I'm not this, maybe I'm that, or maybe my gender isn't really female, maybe it's something else, I don't know. But it, I like the fact that online, it's a lot easier to kind of play with that and check it out. Because in person, it can be a little bit harder. In person, when you put a label on yourself, everybody kind of just assumes that that's what you are. And if you try to change, there's, there's more resistance from people around you. But online, if you go into a new community, you're like, you know what, I think I might be, something else right now, you can test it out. And there's, there's no repercussion. And actually, in really safe environments, many people will be like, okay, that's great. So, yeah. yeah. 
And when it comes to gaming, you know, I know that we're talking a lot about online interactions, and there are, probably as you've heard at different talks here, it might be hard to find characters in non-online games or interactions in non-online games where you might feel that type of connection or feel that type of validation if there isn't a wide range of characters to pick from or a lot of ways to customize and kind of experiment in that way. So a lot of times online gaming is where people find that, uh, that kind of connection. Okay, so some tips for healthy gaming. This can be important if you're, if you're not sure where you stand on this or if you want to try to find a way to make sure that you're not getting into that problem zone. Um, one big thing is living with gaming. You know, when you are, um, when gaming's important to you, you don't just want to drop it completely, you know, it's even if you think that you're having a problem. I think a, a, good, a good scenario would be if people have um, problems with uh, an eating disorder, whether that's overeating, undereating, body image, whatever it might be, you still have to eat. And you still have to live with food. So you have to learn how to live with food. The same goes with gaming. If you have any sort of mobile device these days, you have access to games. So it's not like you can just go cold turkey and yay, I'm done, everything's good. You know, so you have to really learn how to live with gaming. Yeah, and here, one of the things that I wanted to add, um, I, I really like when you had mentioned Raptor when we were talking mm -hmm. before. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Raptor, but if you sign up for it, and it's um, R-A-P-T-R, mm -hmm. if you sign up for it, it'll actually check your gaming, so it'll keep tabs on you. And um, <laughs> it will. And you can actually set it up to even post on your Facebook. So I know that because when I started grad school, it was a really big shift for me, and I wanted to make sure that I got my PhD. And obviously, it worked out because here I am getting it soon. But um, at the beginning, I did install it. I installed it, and I set it up to my Facebook. Why? Because I wanted to keep tabs on myself, and I wanted my friends to be like, well, you know, when you were doing that game, you weren't really studying. So instead of doing that, you should come to a study group. Or, oh, I've already played 10 hours this week. Maybe I should not play more. So it can be a really useful way to just kind of check in on yourself. And that, that way, you're keeping yourself honest, right? I mean, the, the, the program is not going to lie for you. So <laughs> it'll, and it'll even tell you how much you're gaming in comparison to your friends. So I had a couple of other people in the program who gamed as well, and we, we all kind of checked in on each other. So that, that's one of the ways that you can kind of check in. Yeah, getting that support and help from friends if you if you need to get into a healthier gaming space can be good. I've even worked with some people that <laughs> very reluctantly handed over their video card <laughs> to a friend so that they couldn't play a game. Um, I don't know if I could do that, but that yeah, but that would be that would be one way that you could go about that as well. And so you know, like you said with Raptor, like being honest with your time, being honest with uh, with your friends, so that you can get that support if you need it. Well, and just scheduling it in. I, I know that, I mean, we're all different, but for me what really worked was doing my responsibilities first. So I ended up just using it as a reward. Like, okay, I've done a study group today, I've done whatever I need to do for school, now I'm going to game. Instead of the opposite, which would have been to game and eventually get to everything else, so. Yeah. <laughs> the other point to consider is know why you're gaming. Is there something that you're getting out of it that feels important to you? Is it the, the action, the rewards, the community, the distraction? You know, just to try to see, like, what is it that, that's important to me with this? And if I'm using this too much, if I'm using this as a coping skill and really leaning on it, is there something else that I might be able to do instead? You know, so if you're finding that you're using gaming to distract yourself because um, maybe you're dealing with a lot of bullying at school, okay, good, have your distraction, have your safe space, but at the same time, are there ways that, that we can address the bullying as well so that you're not spending as much time on games? At the same time, and this is where that, you know, your problem is a line in the sand kind of thing, if you, say, are living in a country where being gay is considered illegal and you can be killed for it, which there are places like this, um, it may not be safe for you to be out at all but you can be out online if you choose to. So you spend 50, 60 hours a week playing an MMO. Is that a problem? I don't know, probably not. But you really have to consider why you're gaming, what you're getting out of it. Um, is there a healthy way to do it? Are you doing it in a healthy way already? Yeah, and actually I, I really appreciate that you bring up that point. I know that when I was um, 
when I was growing up, it was definitely unsafe where I was. And one of the ways that I was able to explore my own sexuality and gender was online. And a lot of the people who I ended up connecting to were other gamers who were doing the same thing. And it did provide us really was a safe space to be able to do that. Yeah. The other thing on here, uh, this term flow, is comes from psychology. And it's this idea where when you get really into something and you get this peak performance of challenge and excitement and rewards and all this stuff, you get into this headspace where you lose track of everything else. So have you ever had that moment where you sit down and say, OK, I have an hour. I'm just going to play for an hour, and then I have to go do whatever. And then six hours are gone, <laughs> right? That's flow. People get that in, in whatever activity that they, they might really enjoy the most. And, and it's hard to avoid that. You really need to try to break up your time a little bit, be more proactive about not getting into that headspace. And it's not intentional. You know, It's not like you sit down and say, I've got all this work to do, so I'm just going to play for an hour. Well, maybe three, maybe four. OK, I'm just going to keep playing. Like It's not always a conscious decision. You get into this headspace, and time's gone. Right. Oh, and that, that last point there, variety is the spice of life. Um, there's also this thing that happens where if you do the same activity over and over again monotonously, or if you play like the same character, the same you know, class or profession, you start to build these neural pathways. And you start to get entrenched in that. And you start to get into the space where gaming actually becomes more of a chore and it becomes less enjoyable. So the more variety that you can have, and that could just be you know, changing up your game for that day, that can be just trying a new class, trying a new profession, whatever it might be, um, helps to diversify your neurons, basically. Um, so yeah, make sure that you're trying a lot of different stuff. So basically try a lot of different games. Yes, try lots of different <laughs> games. All the games that are here, they're wonderful <laughs> games here. Try them all. You never know. I was never into shooters. I tried Halo, and there, there you go. There we go. <laughs> So here we, we kind of just wanted to put up some games that were therapeutic. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have played some of these games. Actually, Treasure Hunt, I don't think is available publicly. I don't know. No. I, I'm, well, so the top one, Treasure Hunt, is actually a game that's made um, to learn cognitive behavioral therapy skills. So it's something you can use in therapy. And each level teaches you a different skill, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And then the Unfinished Swan, I don't know how many of you have played it. It's an awesome game if you haven't played it yet. It's only on the PS3, though. But um, it's basically about this young boy whose mother passes away. And through the game, he's dealing with his grief. And for some people, working through this game has really helped them deal with their own grief, right? So in each level, he, starts, he actually starts creating the levels based on paintings that his mother had um, to work through it. So it can be very cathartic. Yeah. And, and grief is one of those things that we experience in a lot of different ways. Grief can mean losing a relationship. It can mean losing a loved one. It can mean rejection from family. Um, and so being able to work through that grief, whatever it might be, can be really important. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, oh, go ahead. You want to talk about, well, um, well I, I can talk about Gone Home. Sure. So I think Gone Home is great. I'm just a big advocate of that game. Um, many people have found it to be empowering because of the fact that there actually are queer characters in the game. I mean, that's really rare. So for some people, it's felt, um, well, actually, I'll tell a story that I read online. I wish I could remember who was the author, but it was actually by a trans woman. And she was saying that the reason why she, lo she loved Gone Home is because it allowed her to experience being a teenage girl which is never something that she was able to experience in her own life. And so when she was playing for the game, because the game is in the 90s, I think, is when it's based, um, it would have actually been around the same age that she would have been when she was younger. And so when she played for it, she was like, wow, this let me be a young female who's dealing with her sexuality, who was into a lot of the same things that she was, and it really helped her. I know that for me playing it, it was just really validating to have any character who, not only are there um, all female characters in the game, but the fact that they're actually queer characters was like, wow, I didn't expect that. Yeah, and uh, Papo Iyo is a, a really good game, um, if anybody's played it, that deals a lot with themes of uh, uh, coping with abuse. And uh, it's a really fantastic uh, game, and again, validating for people who might be working through those kinds of issues. Um, and it's unfortunately, abuse is something that we do see a lot in the queer community, uh, coming from a lot of different places. So uh, for some people, they find that very validating, very helpful to, to have that experience. Okay. 
So we wanted to open it up for any questions from the audience. Sure. Um, so when you talk about using gaming as a way of exploring other, you know, uh, genders and how it improves spatial reasoning, that only works if there's a if there's fidelity between the real world and that gaming space, right? So a lot of I, f I feel like a lot of female characters in the RPGs that are play that I'm playing are are very stereotypically female, mm -hmm. and so I don't identify with the male protagonist. But then picking a female one doesn't make me feel that I'm you know exploring another facet mm -hmm. of gender either. Yeah. Just kind of wondering if it's <coughs> an issue. I, I think it sure can be. Uh, so if I if I have your question right, you're asking about. Um, when exploring gender identity and looking at some of the very stereotyped gender identities in some games, if that can be problematic, is that? Yeah. Getting it? Yeah. Like it, it, sometimes it makes me feel more out of place mm -hmm. because I don't identify with all of the characters that I play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 I think that one of the, the problems is that we really don't have a lot of really good um, female characters in video games, right? We don't, are realistic female characters, there's very few of them. And I think that is a problem, unfortunately, in, in the gaming community that there aren't a lot of things to identify. So before when I was mentioning kind of like um, exploring your own gender and sexuality, I, I was actually thinking more about MMOs. And I was thinking that because you can create your own character. Yeah, when it comes to console games, I agree with you that it's really hard sometimes to identify as a woman because maybe the woman, the women that are in the game are very stereotypical. You don't really relate to the male either, and so that is a problem. Um, if you go more into indie games, actually, some of them have characters that are strong female characters that are actually more believable. Yes. Okay, so, um, so at the beginning you said some stuff about research. And I want to push back on that a bit. You started you started by saying that there's you know a lot of negative research and oh it has you know and, and you know it's not very good. And then later you brought up this research that has these positive results. And that sounds sort of awfully convenient. Well, why should well why what makes the you know the positive research better than the negative research? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would say that one of it is, is statistics. So a lot of what happens is that some of the research that talks about negative gaming, um, the, the statistics just aren't very good. Um, when it comes to positive research, you're right that some of them might not be great either. But I have noticed a lot of responses in research that say, here are all the reasons why this research was done and why it's not true. A lot of the positive research that has come out has been from where people have looked at the negative research and said, wait, your methods in this, your statistics aren't really that good. Why don't we replicate this study? And then started to find, wait, we're actually seeing all these positive things coming out of it. Why don't we start looking at some of these positive things as well? Um, so a lot of it was born out of just statistics and uh, looking at um, uh, scientific method and things that were very problematic in some of those, those studies that were becoming more popular. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other? Yes. I just want to comment. Uh, I'm on the autistic spectrum, and I have to say that uh, it really is about knowing what's good for you in gaming, because when I was a child, there was a lot of misunderstanding of what was going on with me, and mm -hmm. it really helped me a lot of times to have the escape for a few hours to play my games until I felt good about myself, because I was accomplishing something and it was so hard for me to accomplish things in the real world. And yeah. then I was a, that, you know, with that uh, reinforcement, I was able to go out and do a lot of things that I might not have been able to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Where were we on time? <laughs> I missed the, oh, the last time we that they popped in. Oh, I think three minutes. Or, okay. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, sure. so, so you were talking about Treasure Hunt, which is not a game that's available to the public. How yeah. could I Um, I, I think you'd have to talk to a therapist because if I remember right when I was looking at the website it actually has to be, so I, actually even I can't get it, it has to be a licensed psychologist I'm pretty sure um, can get the game. And the reason why is because the game is not meant for you to be playing on your own. So it's meant to be an adjunct to therapy, like you're, you're, you're already working with someone, you're working with that Siri, and then you have the game that you can do at home, so it's not really meant for you to do by yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, there, it's unfortunate that there's not more access to something like that, mm -hmm. um, more readily available, but sometimes you have to use those tools and therapy kind of carefully. Um, so it's, yeah, it's 
I go back and forth on that idea a lot too. That was one other point we wanted to mention real quick too. Finding a, a good therapist can be kind of hard. And so if you, it's good to do some research on how to ask those kinds of questions, especially if you're looking for a therapist that's knowledgeable on gaming. If you mention things like Steam and they just kind of cross their eyes and have no idea what you're talking about, <laughs> probably not the right therapist for you to work with. Yeah, and just remember that you're all consumers. So you get to pick who you see. And you can directly ask your therapist, do you know anything about gaming? Do you know anything about the online community? If that's really important to you. And if it is, then maybe that's not the best fit for you. So I think I we're think. probably at time. <laughs> okay, so we'll put up our contact info real quick. So if anybody has, um, wants to get in contact with us, ask some other questions, um, I've got my Twitter up there and email, and you've got your email up there. Yep. Um, so feel free just to fire off an email, and then we'll zoom in on the QR code there for a second. And that'll also give you that information. So give people a second to write it down. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.